Good evening. From our headquarters in Kyiv, this is the Sunday show on Hromadsky International, the only primetime TV program explaining the Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I am Andrei Kulikov. People across Poland protest a draft law that would undermine judicial independence. What you need to know. One year after the murder of journalist Pavel Sheremet, there are still more questions than answers. We speak to the people who knew Pavel best. A Russian soldier captured on Ukrainian territory meets his mother. Will this help jumpstart prisoner exchanges? Cybersecurity expert Ben Nimo discusses the threat of disinformation and cyber warfare. Anti-government demonstrations in Venezuela increasingly resemble Ukraine in 2013 and 14. We find out what's driving the protests. In September, Germans will head to the polls to elect a new parliament. What can we expect after the elections? Go to our webpage and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Search Hromadsky International. We will be back in a second. The Polish parliament has passed a bill that would sack the current Supreme Court justices and allow the ruling Law and Justice Party to replace them. But the bill, which now only needs the signature of President Andrzej Duda, has sparked a wave of protests across the country. The right-wing Law and Justice Party argues that the reform is needed to fight corruption and purge the judicial system of the remnants of communism. But opponents say the bill undermines Polish democracy and would spell the end of judicial independence in the country. I came here today because I know that the most important decisions in the country are made here. I brought the cat which can advise better solutions to Yaroslav Kaczynski. I hope he will finally see that we will not give up. I want our president to be a president because he is not a true president so far. He is the party's functionary who does what his party expects. But we want him to guard the constitution on which he swore an oath. It is hard to expect something from the president because we saw him in other situations. I can only say what a smarter person than me has said. Even if he wants to veto something, he will immediately have to answer to the MP. Romatsky's Matthew Kupfer spoke with Maciej Kuzemski, an Atlantic Council Millennium Fellow, to learn more about the draft law and the people protesting it. Maciej, thank you for joining us today. I want to start off with a fairly fundamental question. If this bill is signed into law, and it appears it will be, how will it affect the Polish political system? Is the draft law as dangerous for Polish democracy as so many people believe it is? It is, uh, it is indeed a very dangerous law uh, for two reasons. First of all, uh, its substance is, ver is fairly dangerous because it effectively politicizes uh, the Supreme Court and most probably the next step would be politicization of uh, the whole judiciary. So it um, uh, effectively removes the um, separations of powers as we know it uh, in, in Poland uh, as of now. But more importantly, it just destabilizes the system as a whole. Um, the bill, um, the way it is proceeded in a very hasty manner, um, being uh, uh, not properly consulted, uh, uh, being uh, rushed through both chambers of the parliament and causing so many protests, um, uh, just uh, um, uh, results in a, in a, in a lowering of, a, of trust um, of a Polish people in the very institutions of Polish state. Mm -hmm. um, polls have protested against the policies of the ruling Law and Justice Party throughout the year, for example, against further restrictions on legal abortion or against education reforms. What makes these protests different? Indeed, um, and this is a fairly interesting point, because um, as much as uh, polls have protested for over, well, almost two years now um, against this administration, um, uh, on, on so many other issues. Um, what is distinct about this protest is that it brings together um, people from totally different backgrounds. 
So if you look at the composition of the protests, and they're, they're not only in Warsaw or in major cities, um, the protests have spread uh, across the country to the smallest of the villages, um, uh, uh, as far as um, as um, uh, in Rzeszów or 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 or, or, or near uh, Szczecin uh, on the border with Germany. Um, so what is interesting is that this is a this is probably the first time when a protests are not driven by parliamentary opposition. B the protests are really um, intergenerational in this in a sense that they bring together people of um, all ages and backgrounds, and most importantly. Um, a vast majority of uh, protesting people are, are young people. At the same time, the Law and Justice Party has a strong electoral base, and it doesn't really appear to care about the protests or about how the party is perceived abroad in the international community. Um, do the protesters have a strategy to reach out to the Law and Justice Party supporters? Um, say again, I'm sorry. Do the protesters have a strategy to reach out to, to the Law and Justice Party supporters? Yes. Well, so at first, uh, during the uh, proceeding of the uh, of the deal in the lower house of the parliament, there was a there was a widespread uh, feeling that the more uh, liberal um, wing um, of the Law and Justice, a um, couple of members of parliament um, who are linked uh, to the uh, deputy prime minister Jarosław Gowin will uh, try to oppose uh, uh, this, this, horrendous, uh, this horrendous bill and this horrendous reform. However, this has not happened. Um, the, the, both the opposition and, uh, and, and protesters have reached out to the, those members of the parliament, uh, have addressed publicly um, the, the ruling party, um, but uh, to no avail. Um, it, 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 it basically didn't gather any, any, any response. And um, I agree with what you said. Um, peace seems not to care too much um, about uh, public opinion um, at this point, uh, be it domestic or international. Peace being the abbreviation for the, for the uh, Law and Justice Party, just to clarify. Uh, the EU is threatened to invoke Article 7 of the European Union Treaty and formally chastise Poland for violating EU democratic standards. What would that mean in practice for Poland? Well, this is a very good question because um, the, the, the treaty has not been triggered in the history of the Euro the, the Article 7 of the treaty has not been triggered in the history of the European Union. So it's a little bit of a blind guess. Um, However, um, it's uh, the role of, uh, of this article uh, is basically to punish the, the countries who are insubordinate and uh, not comply with, uh, with their, um, EU regulations and values. Um, and uh, if this is uh, triggered, it basically means that, um, that, the, that the, this, uh, this article will strip Poland from the voting uh, power in uh, EU's uh, bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, uh, Law and Justice as a party is a very populist party. Do such pro-democracy protests that we're seeing now in Poland work in a populist political environment where the leadership uh, claims to represent the people and paints the opposition as a liberal elite? Um, well, I think uh, at this point, this is, uh, um, it would be safe to say that uh, these protests have nothing to do with a liberal elite. And they are perhaps uh, uh, more about other issues than liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is not a, um, a, 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 a it's, a, it's an abstract value, uh, honestly, and it's not a uh, value that people would unite uh, uh, behind um, uh, across Poland in, uh, in such numbers. I think the protests are, are uh, about some common decency. Um, it's, uh, it's a sense that the uh, ruling party and the government have overstepped uh, uh, their prerogatives and, uh, and went a step too far. Mm -hmm. um, one final question. The bill is waiting for President Andre Duda's signature. Any chance he'll veto it? Well, President Duda is, uh, is, uh, 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 is a veto player in, uh, in this situation. He is the only politician um, of uh, uh, law and justice that cannot be fired by law and justice um, uh, chief uh, um, Jarosław Kaczyński. Um, uh, President Duda has now 21 days after the uh, upper chamber of parliament uh, has, um, has approved the, the bill 
and uh, frankly, all eyes on him. Um, everyone hopes that this will be his defining moment um, of his presidency. However, past performance uh, proves that uh, he was uh, very much in line with a uh, with a party line, with uh, with uh, as far as um, signing government's bill is concerned. So um, no no um, no surprises if uh, if President Duda uh, signs the. Uh, bill uh, and it effectively becomes law. However, there is also a another uh, option um, uh, than than signing it or vetoing it. Uh, the bill um, has been has been proceeded in such a hastily manner that it um, includes many inconsistencies that uh, have been acknowledged even by the members of the government. So, uh, President Duda, safe bet would be to send it to constitutional tribunal to check whether it really complies with the constitution. Mm -hmm. And if he were to do that, what do you think the result would be? Actually, I think the result would be quite similar in long term to the to the to the one uh, when uh, to the scenario where he would sign it, because it would a buy some time for the government to repackage the deal so that it looks more acceptable. Uh, B, um, uh, it would run into a danger for the opposition and the movement that is emerging of uh, losing the momentum. Um, so I think uh, either or, um, the situation is not looking very promising. Mm. Well, we'll keep monitoring the situation in Poland. Maciej, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you and have a great day. You too, thank you. On the 20th of July 2016, renowned journalist Pavel Sheremet was killed when his car exploded in downtown Kyiv. The murder again demonstrated how dangerous the work of journalists is in this country, even if or especially if the journalist in question is a person constantly in the public eye. One year later, the official investigation into Sheremet's murder has stalled and law enforcement has failed to identify any suspects in the case. A significant thing about Sheremet was that he came to Ukraine from Russia, where he found himself after he was exiled from his native Belarus and where, after some time, he also could not work freely. It seemed that Ukraine offered him a safe haven where he could pursue his profession as he desired. On the one-year anniversary of Sheremet's death, colleagues, human rights defenders and friends of the journalist marched from the spot where he was killed to the headquarters of the Interior Ministry and Presidential Administration. There, they demanded that the authorities speed up the investigation into Pavel Sheremet's murder. Когда мы уже въезжали в Минск, все три часа я вот был в наручниках, у меня даже еще остались следы вот от наручников. Слава Украине, героям слава! Живи Беларусь! Я не вижу ваших рук, я не слышу ваших голосов! Слухи про Бойко и Трахметова, губернатор один, другой, это все. Но мы позлили немножко президента, позлили, уже хорошо. А.
Romatsky sat down with Pavel Sherman's daughter, Elizaveta, to get her thoughts on the investigation and the circumstances of her father's killing. What can you say about the way the case is being investigated? At the present moment, the investigation is utterly unsatisfactory to our entire family. It is not the first time we are speaking with representatives of the departments conducting this investigation. Unfortunately, we are not seeing any results or any kind of progress. In the long run, I personally am not expecting any result either from these organizations without the involvement of inter international parties. Unfortunately, these official reports that have been made are not meaningful. They talk about how many resources were used in the investigation, but overlook significant things that make up the investigation and answer questions of who, how, and when. This is a very serious problem from my perspective. What do you think about the idea that Russia or Belarus might be involved in the murder? Returning to the statements that were made this year, we asked these questions to those involved in this investigation about whether there is evidence of a Russian fingerprint. However, there's no evidence. But the problem is that there is no evidence whatsoever regarding the particular involvement of other countries. We're not discounting any possible explanation. We're considering everything. Consequently, we have no reason to lean towards one version or another to any significant degree. We're simply waiting for some result that might direct us towards something. The report describes a day when Sheremet met with Alexander Klimenko, a former minister under ex-president Viktor Yanukovych. Could you describe Pavel's state after the, that meeting or before it? Like in the report, the meeting happened right after I met with my father. Together, we went to where the meeting took place. Yes, he was agitated. He was in a hurry, and he violated traffic regulations. I inquired about that but I received no answers to these questions. He was simply agitated. What would you like to address to the Ukrainian, Russian and Belarusian authorities? Mostly to the Ukrainian authority, because they're the ones investigating. It doesn't make sense to address the Russian and Belarusian ones. I would like there to be honesty and openness, and for their promises, which are endless, to be fulfilled, and for the investigation to be completed, and for all of the people responsible for his murder to be found. We also spoke to Sevhil Musayeva Borovik, editor-in-chief of the Ukrainska Pravda online news site, and one of Sherem's colleagues. She says she believes that eventually the truth will come out. Sevgil, given how the investigation is going, do you still believe that the case will be solved? I'm confident that even if not under this president, this Minister of Internal Affairs or National Police Chief, sooner or later we'll find out who the murders are, where their goals were, because there is a huge demand for the truth. We often ask why the identities of the people who planted the bomb haven't been published yet. The authorities first answered that they were hot on the trail. Then they said they don't want to put those suspects, who might not have committed the crime, at risk. Former investigators and law enforcement officers with significant experience all say that. If there was desire for it, the case couldn't be fully investigated during this year. They're convinced that this sabotage can be logically explained and that there is something that may be hidden from the public. I can say that, after what happened this year, people who are working in journalism in Ukraine, they don't feel safe anymore. We all are worried because we don't understand it. The main message of this murder is that no one is safe, and the investigation that isn't really working means it can happen again. Do you have any information about what has changed within the official investigation since the release of the film Killing Pavel? I was questioned in April for the last time. It was before the release. After that, nobody contacted me. The investigators don't tell me much because I'm a witness, not a victim in this case. 
I think that the affected side may have more details. I know that the former security service employee, Ihor Yutishmienko, was questioned, and also the authors of The Killing Pavel. The official investigation suggested journalists, including the independent investigative unit Bellingcat, should corroborate to uncover some facts, pictures, or any other information. When CPJ had a meeting with our law enforcement and with the president of Ukraine, who had earlier promised to take the case under his personal control, there were no new details. Currently, the National Police and the head of the Ministry of Interior Affairs, because they are the subjects who are directly investigating the case. Meanwhile, the Interior Ministry maintains that the investigation is ongoing and moving as quickly as it can. On February 8th, we held a large press conference and we informed the public that the investigation continues. We showed that there is an ongoing investigation which is examining a huge number of materials. The investigation has given some results, that's for sure, but we do not yet have defined suspects. The mother of a Russian soldier detained on Ukrainian territory visited her son yesterday. Viktor Agev, a Russian citizen, was captured by Ukrainian forces on the 25th of June while fighting with Russia-backed militants in the unrecognized Luhansk People's Republic. The Ukrainian government gave his mother, Svetlana Agieva, the opportunity to visit him. The head of the Ukrainian security service, Vasily Gritsak, stressed that the Ukrainian government wants to speed up the prisoner exchange process between Kyiv and Russia-backed separatists. Agiev is on the exchange list with the LPR. Romanski's partner, Novaya Gazeta, interviews the mother and son about their meeting. We are in Сын пообщался с журналистами, затем мы... наша встреча произошла, пока я ждала, я общалась с начальником СИЗО. Угу. Вот. <coughs> ну, наконец-то это... я к этому шла, вот, вот два дня уже мы добираемся, очень помогла нам в этом, в этом... украинская сторона, очень помогла. И пользуясь случаем, очень хочется поблагодарить всех и присутствующих здесь. Конечно, я немножко ожидала другое, но на самом деле оказалось, что вообще встретили такой толерантный такой прием был, отношения были доброжелательные, старались сделать, оказать внимание, прекрасно и поселили в гостинице и то есть ну отношение было очень хорошее и такое человеческое я очень хочу чтобы ты быстрее вернулся на мой язык я тоже хочу In the wake of Russian interference in the American and French presidential elections, disinformation and cyber warfare have been matters of grave public concern. But what is the role of the state in digital security? Should it protect us and should we want such protection? Romanski asked Ben Nimmo, an information defense fellow at the Atlantic Council. If you think about government responses, the, the government responses have been limited pretty well everywhere. And actually there's a very good reason for that, which is that if you think about the way a democracy works, you have to have a strong and independent press which is capable of holding power to account. You have to have journalists in every country who can say, actually, minister, what you're saying is not true. And if you think about that in the context of fake news, the wrong response would be to say, right, we will give the government lots of power to control the news because somebody somewhere is going to say, oh, I've got the power to control the news now. Well, I didn't like that headline about me the other day. So there has to be a limitation on what governments and lawmakers and international organizations do about the news, because we need the news to be free. We need the news to be independent, and that means independent of political control. What you have seen and what's most promising 
is that the media themselves have woken up to this. They've woken up both to the fact that it's a problem and to the fact that they are being targeted and that at various times various dif different media have broadcast stuff which turned out to be fake news. Now for a real journalist and a real news organisation that is a damage to their reputation to be, to be found that you have not done your job properly and you've broadcast fake news and there is a lot more writing in the media, in the real media, the mainstream media nowadays about fake news, disinformation, propaganda, how it works and how it fits together and that is therefore spreading the understanding and spreading the concept of what the problem is. And what is the role of these big media data companies like Facebook and Google and the others in, in that game? Because they are, in some of them, they are more powerful than some of the governments. They are, but again, it's, you, you need to ask the question, is it, is it Twitter which is more powerful or is it a person who has 100,000 followers on Twitter who is more powerful? Is it, is it the user or is it the platform? The main way in which platforms like Twitter and Facebook get abused is that people create networks of fake accounts. For example, I recently discovered a network of fake accounts on, on Twitter which had at least 9,500 accounts all running the same thing. So that's one person who can run 9,000 different accounts. Anything they tweet can get amplified 9,500 times just like that. That's incredibly dangerous and that is the sort of system which platforms like Facebook and Twitter absolutely need to crack down on. Um, so as somebody who really research, uh, what do you give, because there is a general idea, there are fake news, there are bots, there are all kind of, there is cyber warfare, but what's really happening? What are today the most popular, uh, you know, unconventional ways of uh, using the information besides, you know, you, we can speak a lot about Russia today, but in particular, what are those tools, um, if we go in details, that you, you know, found? There's one technique which you see time and again. I, I think of it as vilify and amplify. So let's say that you're a foreign government, you control everything from the foreign ministry to the broadcasters to internet trolls to internet bots. You find one person who says the thing that you like and then you get all the different parts of your machine to amplify that message. And you point to it and say, look, it's not us saying it. All we're doing is reporting it. But the effect is to take one person's voice and to amplify it a hundred thousand times. And by doing that, A, you're encouraging other people who believe the same thing to speak louder, and B, you are making that person artificially loud. Are we specifically um, speaking now, for instance, Russia is often mentioned, but is there doing something unique? or this kind of, some kind of the practices, uh, you know, we follow the US elections, but in generally today, can we already speak about some particular, you know, uh, groups of people in the geographic areas which we can identify using the practices you describe? Something we've seen a lot is groups from the political extremes will effectively work together with Russia to promote a particular story, to tell a particular story. And normally that will be all about attacking somebody from the political center. And it's, you can't say who started this. For example, in France, for decades there has been a very strong nationalist far-right party, the National Front. It's always been there. In Russia, for decades, there has always been a state propaganda system. What we've seen in the last few years is that Russian state propaganda has been supporting the far right in France, and the far right in France has been supporting Russian state propaganda. And, and if you ask yourself, well, where did it start? You're kind of missing the point. What's, what's important is that you have this devil's alliance between the Kremlin propaganda machine and the far right in France, both of, of whom have the same goal, which is to make the political center in France weak and to make strongly pro-European sentiment in France weaker. And we all we ask, what in the end is really the evidence that Russia is that strong in cyber warfare? Mm. Uh, one of the problems we're seeing now is a lot of people aren't being very subtle in their analysis. And, and it's at the stage where any time anybody, for example, sees the operation of a botnet on Twitter, some journalist will phone me and say, was it a Russian one? It's like, well, it might have been. It might equally have been a French one or an American one or a Canadian one. And so 
there is, you always need to be very precise in your definitions. What we do know about the Russian operation is that a number of credible expert groups in the cyber industry have said independently that individual hacks have been traced back to Russian hackers. And in fact, the other day we had President Putin saying, well, maybe it was patriotic hackers, in the same way that a couple of years back President Putin said, well, maybe the Russian soldiers in Ukraine are just patriots who are there on holiday. But really, in, 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 if you speak about the organization like NATO, like EU, who are on it, uh, really, do we have the funds allocated to the, you know, cyber defense? And if that, what that? Training the professionals, I know, buying equipment? In terms of the official responses, for example, NATO has a cyber defense division which makes sure that NATO's own systems are secure. That's its job. There's also a cooperative cyber defense center in Tallinn where various different countries come together and basically test each other's cyber defenses and they run joint exercises and they try and make sure that they've all got cyber defenses in place. So there's cooperation going on. But again, it's not, it wouldn't be NATO's job to run the cyber defenses of a NATO member state. That's the job of the member state. In the same way, it's not the EU's job to run the defenses of the member state. It's the job of the member states. And within the member states, you know, it's not the government's job to police my email account. That's my job. And so the, the problem with cyberspace above all is that cyberspace is everybody who has an internet connection. And ultimately, you don't want somebody else reading your emails. And therefore, you need to be careful about how do you protect your own. So it really starts with the basic user. It starts from your own keyboard at home. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is cracking down on opponents, but the people are responding in protest. In March, Maduro loyalists in the Supreme Court ruled to dissolve the National Assembly, the Venezuelan elected legislature controlled by the opposition. The move, which opponents say is unconstitutional, effectively ended the opposition's role in lawmaking and sparked violent protests across the country. As protests continue to grip the South American country, analysts are increasingly pointing out similarities between the Venezuelan demonstrations and Ukraine's 2014 Euromaidan revolution. Hromatsky spoke with Inaki Sagarzazo, assistant professor of political science at Texas Tech University, to find out more. Um, you also argue that there are a lot of similarities between what's happening in Venezuela now and what was happening in Ukraine back in 2013-14. Would you please explain what are the main similarities between both situations? Yes, well, um, there's a government that doesn't want to uh, check what people want to do, uh, that it's growing uh, ever so more authoritarian. There is an opposition that is being imprisoned. Uh, where its leaders are being persecuted, um, and there's a uh, there's a people that uh, want to express themselves, but turned out that the only way to uh, express themselves is through protests, and those protests have grown uh, more and more uh, violent as time goes on, with the increased repression of the government. So there there's a few similarities to the situation in Ukraine. Um, that we, we believe uh, can be seen in Venezuela today. Why do you think that a Ukrainian case is uh, so much of an inspiration for, for protesters uh, from uh, Venezuela? Well, I think Venezuelan people saw that uh, people in Ukraine protested and through protest successfully managed to achieve uh, a change in government, right? Um, and, and I think a lot in the opposition feel desperate that the, the traditional political democratic way has not uh, paid out, right? And, and that the government keeps taking advantage of them um, and violating the, the constitution. Um, and they keep, um, in that sense, they... They, they see that in Ukraine it was possible to change the government via protest, and so they, they believe they, they're trying to uh, achieve that as well. 
There was a referendum last Sunday about and um, around 98% of people voted against constitutional changes suggested by the president of the country. What are we expecting to happen next? This was a, a population of voters that was biased towards the opposition, right? It was not an official a referendum. It was something organized by the opposition. And with a, an impressive 7 million voters, uh, it was quite significant, but it's not the whole picture of the Venezuelan electorate. What we can expect today from the opposition is that they're going to make a broad pronouncement um, calling against the, the, the Constituent Assembly um, and perhaps starting... Uh, to create a new institutional um, organization. This September, Germans will head to the polls to elect a new parliament. But what kind of foreign policy will the new government choose? And what will it mean for Ukraine? Romatsky spoke with Andrei Novak, a Germany-based expert on Eastern Europe, to find out. In Germany, in autumn, you um, have an election. Uh, what can we expect from this? Will there be any major change? Well, I was uh, I was one of uh, I spoke to some Ukrainian partners uh, three months ago, uh, and I told them, you know, it's uh, I'm I think this year is going to be better for uh, Europe and, and worse for the Kremlin than many people think because I said I, d I don't think that uh, they uh, will the populists will win in, in the Netherlands so there even if Wilders gets enough vo votes he won't get a majority he won't be able to form a government the same in France and the same in Germany so uh, in Germany the likelihood now of uh, a change in the Chancellor is currently not not uh, very high, so it's likely that that uh, Merkel will be the chancellor after the election. So there will be continuity in foreign policy, even if uh, Martin Schulz were to win. Um, he's also, uh, you know, s strong pro-European uh, voice, even if maybe less experienced with uh, Eastern Europe and with Russia. Um, so, um, but the likelihood is that we'll again have Merkel. The question is what kind of coalition government will she form? Uh, she will likely need some partners, uh, either from the Liberals or from the Greens, or again with, uh, with the Social Democrats in a big coalition. So, um, I think there will be continuity in the German foreign policy area, so we can see uh, the tandem of Macron and Merkel uh, working together in the next years. And my last question to you, how do you think how uh, the relationship between Trump and Merkel will influence on European politics? Well, the thing is, I think there's, a, there's a quite an element of unpredictability with Trump. You know, there are mixed signals from Washington. Uh, they are considering exporting more and other better arms to Ukraine, for example, uh, currently. Um, but uh, in terms of Germany, they will tr try to keep things civil and positive with America, but also chart their own way and work towards strengthening Europe. And this is it for tonight. From the entire team of Gromadsky International, thanks for watching us. Check the full versions of our reports and interviews at our webpage en.gromadske.ua. Search and follow Gromadsky International on Facebook and Twitter. Stay tuned for our latest updates. <laughs>